If you have or suspect you may have a health problem, or if you require answers to specific health care questions or concerns, you should consult your physician or health care provider and not depend solely on information presented in this program. Hello, I'm Dr. Steve Garner. Welcome to Ask the Doctor. This series was created to assist you in understanding medical issues so you can take charge of your own health. This is our eighth season, and each week has been busier than the last. Your calls have surely helped others. There are two ways to get your questions in. First, by calling in tonight, or second, go to the website at netny.net slash askthedoctor. I'll take those questions for future discussions. For this episode, I have Dr. Anastasia Nikitna, attending cardiologist and private practice affiliates for both New York Methodist Hospital and Lenox Hill Hospital. Then I have Dr. Thomas Rusi, pulmonary attending at New York Methodist Hospital. And last but not least, we have Dr. Reginald E. Manning, orthopedic medicine attending at New York Methodist Hospital. Welcome to all of you. And it's been a very busy week. Um, I know our own bishop has uh, undergone coronary artery bypass surgery. We're going to talk a little bit about this. And of course, um, some other topics, the swine flu has not gone away. And let's, so let's get right into the news, and then we're going to get into our quiz. Firstly, we know that Bishop DiMazio had coronary artery bypass surgery, and I, I thought it would help to understand if I brought in an x-ray and showed exactly what we were talking about. And this is the artery of the heart, one of the arteries, and this is the normal way it should look. And you see when we get to where the arrow is that you don't see any continuation of the artery. And what happens is that it's becoming narrowed by buildup of plaque and, and fat over the years. And the heart, actually, in that area, when it doesn't get enough oxygen, it begins to give you pain. And if you get total lack of oxygen, it dies, and you get what you call a heart attack. This is what we know as the heart attack. What the surgeons attempt to do is to take a vein from another part of the body that's not needed in that area, bring it to the arteries of the heart, and actually, you would hook it from here to here, bypassing the tight area, hence the name coronary artery bypass graft. And in good hands, this has a very high success rate, a mortality or, or dying from this of less than 1%. And the key is to go to a hospital where they're doing a lot of them and they have a good track record. So I thought this would be interesting for people to see. So this is not the bishops, but this is an example of what the surgeons could have encountered and how they're going to treat that problem. So I'm going to put this back down. And just to explain again, here's the heart, and the red are the arteries supplying the muscle. This is the muscle of the heart. Again, when one of these becomes blocked, just as we saw there, it has to be fixed. Now, one of the ways to fix it, we've heard of angioplasty, where we actually make it bigger by using a balloon. We also can put in a stent. And the other is the open heart surgery, where you actually make a, a sore and cut through the chest bone, open it up. You look at the heart, you put the patient on a heart-lung machine so that the heart is not beating during the surgery. Because you can imagine, if you try to sew and the heart was beating like that, you might nick the wrong area, so you want to keep the heart silent. And the heart-lung machine breathes, breathes for the patient, and it keeps the heart at rest, and the surgeons can do their work. And usually in about six to ten weeks, you're back at, at uh, your work. And people are usually out of the hospital in about one week. So we wish the bishop well and hope that this helps to explain to, to you exactly what he had done. Now, other, also in the news, parents of heavy children really need to take heart because what they're doing is setting up the child for heart disease just as we saw later on in life. And it seems that the children who are overweight, who even, have the, well, even though their arteries are normal, have the markers, have the high cholesterol, have areas of the arteries that are already beginning to become narrowed as young children. So it's important for parents to avoid having um, overfeeding the children and to teach them the right foods to eat, the fruit and vegetables as opposed to sodas and candy and so on. So it starts in childhood and you really set your child up. You want to give your child a good future. If the child is overweight, get into the doctor so you can get some kind of a plan devised and you can check the cholesterol and other, other factors. So it's very important. And then the other issue, which I thought would have gone away, but the swine flu. And unfortunately, we hear tonight of seven deaths in the city.
from swine flu. And it's, I, know, I know many of us are seeing people close to us who are having the swine flu. And basically at this time of the year, if you're having high fevers, muscle aches, it's the swine flu because there's no other flu going around. And of course you want to get in quickly to your doctor if you have that to, for Tamiflu, which would be a medication that will help uh, cut down on the duration and may even stop the disease from occurring. But hearing about seven deaths is kind of scary because Oh, is the virus changing somewhat to become a little bit more severe than it had been previously? So it's something that we don't have the answer to yet, but something that we definitely want to keep our eye on and work very quickly on developing a vaccine so that we can inoculate or vaccinate people so they will not be affected by this virus. Hopefully this can come by the fall. All right, so that's a, t it's a tough week, a lot of stuff going on. Uh, let's see Monsignor Bennett out there, hasn't missed a show in eight seasons now, right? And Monsignor, I know he loves the puzzle. So let's get right to the puzzle. And uh, remember, the prize is that coveted plaque, which very few people have. Only five exist so far, because we've had five winners. And this is one that you can rack your brains on. You, you take uh, a dictionary, take the whole dictionary, and there's only one word in that dictionary that ends in the letter MT. So only one word in the English language that ends in MT. What is that word? I wanted to get it in early, because this is a tough one. It may take the whole show to get it. but. Um, Let's see what happens. I think Rosemary was our big winner last week, so we'll see what's going on there. And of course, when we come back, we'll see who our first caller is. Is it Danny? Is it Anna or Maddie? Tough, tough competition we've been having for that. But uh, while we have that suspense going on, let's go right to a break. And our phone number is 718-499-6101. So you can call and talk about cardiology, lung disease, or orthopedic problems. And we come back, we'll meet the doctors and get right to your call. So the number again is 718-499-6101. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Ask the Doctor. And again, our topics are cardiology, lung disease, and orthopedics. The number to call is 718-499-6101. We're going to get right to the phones and find out who our first caller was who hello 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 hi who is this this is Matt, maddie maddie hi you made it again first caller oh i, I know you're getting joel depressed but um okay what can we do I for you yeah i Ma wanted to ask okay maddie you got to turn the tv I off i haven't heard yeah. any uh, I, I haven't heard anything about whooping calls Whooping oh, cough. whooping cough. Yes, we know about that. Why? Anything particular you want to know about whooping cough? Maddie's on a delay. Yeah, that's no, the problem. Ma but you know what? In my times, we used to have the whooping cough, and my mother used to take us to the around the corner where they had the gas tanks. Uh huh. And that used to simmer our coughs. The gas like tanks. Was, uh, gas. You know, the, uh, it was in the air, but ah. it was gas tanks. Well, this is unusual. I really haven't heard, but I'm, I know I'm glad we have Dr. Rusi here, our pulmonary uh, lung specialist. Let's see if he's, if he's ever heard of it. They have their own remedy. Well, Dr. Rusi, have you ever heard of... We're lucky. We're lucky we didn't pass out. <laughs> <laughs> so, Maddie, let's see what Dr. Rusi has to say. Hi, Maddie. I think that's a great question. In fact, um, I think you're more perceptive than you realize. Whooping cough is probably underdiagnosed. Um, it's caused uh, by an organism known as pertussis. And uh, I think it's underdiagnosed because a lot of patients have a cough and their doctors put them on antibiotics that commonly actually cover uh, pertussis. So um, although the doctors may not check uh, specifically for the, uh, the antibody to pertussis, a lot of patients are being treated for whooping cough without even realizing it. Really? Because I haven't heard about it in a long time. Do you ever hear this gas tank? Um, what do you think that is? That I haven't heard about, but actually, we also think of whooping cough in patients who have a cough that is very, very persistent and has a, a characteristic, almost barking characteristic to it. Usually think of that in children, but I guess you children also yeah. adults too. Yeah, interesting. Maddie, thanks. Always interesting caller. Okay. Before we go to thank you. Thanks, Maddie. Before we go to Joel, I have to be a good host. I have to introduce my guest, Dr. Nikitna. Hi, welcome back. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Garrett. What's new? Anything since we saw you last? I uh, had a vacation, a very short vacation. Would you I, have? Went, I went to London, uh, which was Ooh. very rain, rainy and cold. As typical, as typical here, for London. Yeah. You know anything about St. Petersburg? 
I'm supposed to go I there. Mean, I, I went there a couple times when I was a child. It's beautiful, oh. beautiful. It's, you should go once in life. It's my 30th anniversary. Is there romance in the air in St. Petersburg? A lot. Oh, all right. So look out, <laughs> so look out. I, right I got to get my sleep. Okay, I'll get plenty of sleep. <laughs> okay, thank you for that. And Dr. Rusi, it's great to have you. I know your mother's a big fan of um, the show. Yes, she is. It, it's a small world, and it's actually very funny. She mentioned to me, even before she knew that I work at the same hospital with you, uh, that she's a big fan of yours. And I mentioned this to you in the hallway, and you were kind enough to actually call her up on her cell phone. Unfortunately, I think she was driving, but you left the voicemail. I just heard crunching noise, <laughs> so I don't know what that But was. you left the voicemail, yeah. and she was tickled oh. pink, and I think she still saved the message on her thank uh, you. What's cell her phone. What's Marietta. So Marietta, thank you for joining in tonight. Thank you for giving us your son. He's excellent physician and really so well-respected. I know the, the uh, producer wants me to move on, but I can't. I have to give him a stew. And of course, Dr. Manning, Reggie Manning. How are things? Uh, busy. Your daughter, right? Your daughter graduated? Uh, she graduated law school. Yes, she yeah, did. Fantastic. Uh, mm -hmm. We're going to be able to use her at all? Uh, she's in um, <laughs> um, corporate law and um, uh, business law, so um, I don't think medical stuff. Okay, one of the good lawyers. Exactly. Okay, very yeah. good. So now let's get over to Joel on line two. Joel. Oh, hi, Dr. Garner. I hope you're not feeling too depressed. I think Maddie beat you again. No, I feel better. You know, uh, I don't like being first. It makes me nervous. <laughs> yes, I know. I know. <laughs> So um, we have an illustrious panel up here tonight. What uh, can we do for you? So I have a question for uh, Dr. Rusi. Um, you know, my girlfriend, she's real sick. Uh, I think she's got that swine flu. Uh, she's got high fevers up to like 102. She's had it all day long for about 24 hours, not going down. And she's got this cough. And I'm just wondering, you know, what we should do and what we should watch for to bring her into the hospital for cough changes. She's not coughing anything up. Um, but, you know, I just want to watch out for certain things. Sure. Um, Joel, I think uh, we're dealing right now in a lot of un uncharted water with the swine flu, but I think uh, uh, the consensus that amongst most of the physicians right now, if you have a mild run-of-the-mill cold, not to run to your doctor and panic, not to run to the emergency room, but certainly if the symptoms are severe enough, you're describing fever, and I think if shortness of breath, and, and just not getting better, then I think it is worth uh, getting tested. And the test is uh, rather simple. It's just a swab that goes in the nose, and the results come back within less than an hour. Um, I don't think many doctors are doing the test in their office. I, I think most of the emergency rooms, I know at Methodist, they're doing it there. And um, just to, to have that knowledge, it might be worthwhile doing. Uh, as far as Tamiflu, I think the indication is within 48 hours of having the severe symptoms, you would be, uh, she would be a candidate for the treatment. Otherwise, after that time period, it doesn't, uh, uh, it's not as effective. And we're hearing in the news today about this increased number of deaths that we're seeing, so definitely, I know that Nikita, have you seen any of your patients come in with this flu? Not really, no, because most of my patients vaccinated in, in general, and uh, um, you usually recommend vaccination for people who are in high risk, who have lung disease or heart disease or diabetes, elderly people. Because one of the one of the fears is pneumonia as a complication, right? And that's right. it. So um, we hope she feels better, Joel. Thanks. I'm going to make her take that Tamiflu. I think. Sounds yeah. So. Yeah, I would see your doctor and, and see if she's a candidate to be tested. I think um, that would be definitely worthwhile. Joel, okay, I know. Thanks you, a lot, Joel. I was just going to tell them last week was one of our best shows that I've ever seen, and it's going to be repeated tonight at 10 o'clock. Oh, so great! For, I enjoyed it too. Uh, I enjoyed watching it a lot. So 10 o'clock tonight, Eastern Standard Time, uh, Eastern Daylight Savings Time. <laughs> so, so all those who are keeping score at home, okay? okay thanks. Take care. We're now going to go to John, who's waiting patiently. John. Hello. How are you, John? Good. Good. Where are you calling us from? We're calling from Diker Heights, Brooklyn. Oh, not far. I was just over at a party at the golf course recently. <laughs> yeah, it's a beautiful place. Yeah. You ever play that course? Uh, no, I haven't. Beautiful, yeah. What do, we, what do you got? Uh, I have a question for Dr. Rusi. Okay. Uh, my doctor recently started me on Singular for my asthma, and I was wondering if there are any side effects similar to prednisone that I should look out for. Wow. Oh. I have your email, too. I, I just come across that, actually. So, um, oh. Dr. Rusi, what about that? that that's a great question. Um, asthma? Uh, basically, it, it still is a significant problem. Uh, I see a lot of it. Um, I think um, one of the main characteristics of asthma is inflammation, and both Singular and prednisone target that inflammation. The good news is uh, Singular actually does have a lot less side effects than prednisone. 
So part of the beauty of, pre of uh, Singular over the years is having patients who warrant it as a maintenance therapy, um, I found that they um, are less frequent in need of the prednisone, which does have a long list of side effects. So uh, just to summarize, that Singular has a lot fewer side effects. It's been around for a while, very safe. Uh, the side effects are few and far between as compared to prednisone. Does that help you? Yeah, great. Very good. Thanks a lot. Thanks for using the, um, the internet, too. Thanks very much, Dr. Rusi. Take care. Thank Be you. well. Let's go to Marie. Hi, Marie. Yes. Where are you calling us from, Marie? Um, I'm calling you from Brighton Beach, uh, Brooklyn. Oh, very nice. You near the train? Yes, not too far. I'm, I'm going to be going there so a Friday night to eat at Tatiana. Oh, so have a good time. Enjoy the Russian food. It's nice, right? The ball was beautiful. It's Anybody? lovely. I just hope you have nice weather because it's supposed to rain again. On Friday? Oh. Yeah, it's unfortunate, but it's, it's been, been raining for quite some time. All right, so um, brighten us up a little bit. All Let right. Uh, now, I don't know if I'm going to brighten you up a little bit, but this is the question I have to ask. Two questions. First, I'd like to ask the orthopedic doctor question, then the cardiologist. I'm sorry I couldn't ask the pulmonary doctor question, but thank God I don't have any pulmonary problems. Okay. But uh, the um, orthopedic doctor, a year ago I, I do very long walking on the boardwalk, and when I came home I had excruciating pain in my leg. It radiated from my ankle all the way up to my thigh, and then I started hearing a clicking sound in my knee. So I tried to nurse it myself. I used, you know, heating pads and so forth. But to no avail, I had no relief. So I went to an orthopedic doctor, and at first did an X-ray, and he said, I have a knee spur. He said, but let me do an MRI, which he did. And I was diagnosed with stage 3 arthritis of the knee, as well as the deterioration, the beginning of the inner aspect of the patella, it's starting to deteriorate. What can I do to prevent any more, you know, any more injury to the knee. Right now I'm doing well. I'm walking fine now. I no longer have the clicking sound in my knee, but I, do t I take long walks, and he told me to lose a lot of weight. What would be the best thing for me to okay, do? Let's see, Dr. Manning. Sure. Well, um, weight loss would be uh, one thing uh, to consider. The other thing would be consider um, changing uh, your exercise pattern, uh, particularly if you're heavy and doing a lot of walking on a hard surface. It's a lot of wear and tear across all the weight-bearing joints, the ankle, the knee, the hip, and the low back. What should I do? Um, biking is one alternative, elliptical training, cross-country, Nordic track, skiing, water activities, weight training, a lot of things you can do that uh, eliminate the pounding. So you don't have to stop walking, but I'd probably uh, temper that with maybe one day of non-impact type activities, and the weight loss is also good. If you have really, really bad pain, an anti-inflammatory might be uh, helpful, like a lever, or Advil. Well, I really have, I'm totally asymptomatic at this time. I really have no pain. Sometimes when I walk up the steps, or no, mostly when I walk down the steps, sometimes I do have pain. Mm -hmm. But then I did join Bally's, but then unfortunately I fell and I hit the back of my head and, and, and my back, and they told me I have osteoporosis of my lower back. So then I stopped going to Bally's. I was only afraid that I would do more injury with the exercises. Well, yeah, particularly if you fall, that's not a good thing. But um, exercise in general is good if you're careful. Um, that helps control, control the weight, helps with the heart, uh, helps with your metabolism, and keeps your muscles strong, which is good for your balance going forward. Marie, let's go to the cardiologist, Dr. Nikitina. What's uh, the question? Can I ask the orthopedic doctor one more, one more no, thing? No, no, let's, mo let's move on to the cardiologist. Okay, the cardiologist, okay. I have a very bad pro I have a hiatal hernia, and I take a PPI, you know, proton pump inhibitor, and I've been on all of them. It causes t a tremendous amounts of flatulence and, and also, uh, you know, abdominal cramps. In any event, I, w I was on Prilosec 40 milligrams, and that was working. But then I started getting palpitations from the drug. So I went and looked it up in the PDR, and it said it can cause palpitations. So I stopped taking it. I mean, do you have any answers to that? Should I go back on it, or you don't advise me to? Tell me... Um Mary, uh, how long you been taking Prilosec? Well, I, I stopped taking it right now, but now I'm, on, I'm taking But how long you been taking before oh, you stopped? I'm 47 years old and I'm 60 okay. now. So you, you were uh, taking for many, many years and you never had any problem before and then... Oh, uh, no, I always had flatulence. Uh, how about palpitations is what your concern no, is right now, ever. right? Okay, and how about right now? Do you have palpitations since you start, uh, stopped? Uh, no, no, no. I went to the doctor and he put me on an altar monitor. Okay. Uh, and everything was okay. I just had a okay. supraventricular attack, okay. one isolated SVT, and that was it. Uh, 
again, how many times did you have palpitations? I just tried to... Oh, that this. time? About for about a day and a half. Okay, and since that you never had the uh, symptoms no, again? No, okay. not really. And supraventricular tachycardia is something you can treat with, uh, with a different medication or, or with the catheters. Uh, I, I think you seriously need to see a cardiologist as you did when uh, you did a holter monitor. Prolisac rarely ca uh, causes any symptoms as you described. And if you never had a palpitations before for uh, f more than five years, I don't think it's related to that uh, pill. One thing we're related to. You don't think it was related to the pill? No, but she I'm doesn't. Not, but I'm in menopause too. Could that cause palpitations? It can, but it does not cause a supraventricular tachycardia. No, no, I had it only when he did the, when they, he read the ultimatum, just that I had one SVT. Right, it, we, we, I have to, you doctor should tell you how long was SVT, because SVT is in general is benign, something benign. You can just feel a couple bits, but if it's too long and you feel lightheadedness, you feel dizziness. No, and, I didn't uh, have that. Yeah, Thanks, Maria. Then it's, 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 Dr. Nikitin is in your neck of the woods, so maybe you make an appointment for a second opinion with her. And also, I, I heard you talk about Prelisac and I think those are associated with osteoporosis, some, some of those yes. medications, yes, right, Reggie? Mm -hmm. um, but um, there could be other factors. I don't know her general health, yeah. but there could be other factors as well. So, Marie, thanks for the call, and uh, yeah. call us again, okay? Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Hi, Claudette. Hi. How are you? Uh, I hope I'm doing good. I, you called last week, remember? Yes, I did, yeah. and I um, got the MRI done. And what happened? And they said everything is fine. It doesn't show anything. Just give but us a... My give shoulder still made that clicking sound, and it goes down to my upper arm. And the doctor keeps asking me if my neck is numb, my neck hurts. I tell him, no, my neck is fine. There's nothing wrong with my neck. He insists on doing an X-ray. So they did the X-ray today, and um, the technician... Because I was making a big deal, because I, I didn't want to do X-ray in my neck, because... I don't have a problem in my neck. Yeah, I want to ask Dr. Manning, because I remember I told you call this week because we have the orthopedist, and here he is. So, Dr. Yeah. Manning, what I'm about I'm not this? sure of a symptom complex. Um, you said you get a clicking in your shoulder? In, in, my, in my shoulder and my <laughs> upper arm. I mean, it all is sound like my bones are breaking up. But when, when do you get that clicking? You get it when you're using the shoulder or at rest? It's, I could just be reaching for something or just move it. It, it just happens. It's, when I'm doing any little thing, it just... And no history of any injuries or trauma to the shoulder in the past? No injury, no trauma. And it, when it do the clicking, it hurts. Can, can I ask and you about how from, old you are, ma'am? Excuse me? Can I ask you your age? I'm 50. Okay. Um, there is a tissue called a meniscus in the joint between the end of the collarbone and the top of your wing blade. And with age, that can degenerate and can cause clicking with use, particularly overhead activities. I, I would imagine it should be picked up on an MRI, but if they're not looking for it, they may miss it because it's, it's a very small structure. Um, if, if, what, one way to, to help diagnose that is to get an injection in that joint with um, a lidocaine, a novocaine. If that takes away the clicking and the pain, then that's probably the problem. If that's the problem, then probably should have that, that uh, disc removed along with a little piece of bone. It's called a Mumford procedure. Um, but you need to get a firm diagnosis first. But, but, so what, um, should, what do you suggest? Claudette, it sounds yeah. like you need a little bit more workup. Um, what, what should I suggest the doctor do? Because he did the x-ray, he did the MRI. Well, as, 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 I, as I just suggested, you, you probably should get an injection in that joint and see if that's the tender. First, if, that, if that's a tender area. Should if I it see is, another doctor? Say again? Should I see a different doctor? Well, I, I, don't, I don't encourage you to change your doctor, but if, if, um, um, if you're not happy with him or you're not, you want a second opinion, then certainly you should. Because he insists that it's my neck. And then, when, let me tell you, when he x-rayed my neck today, the technician came to me and told me that, oh, you think it's my neck. I asked him why. He said, my neck is too straight. That could be a sign of some muscle spasm, and you may have what we call a radiculopathy, meaning a pinched nerve type situation, but often that gives you pain running down the arm and neck. But so it wouldn't cause any clicking in the shoulder. Claudette, sounds like, you know, as I, as I urge at the end of the show, if things aren't going well, you go to a second doctor and get another opinion. It's always a good idea, okay? Can um, someone neck be too straight? I didn't understand the question. Can someone's neck be too straight? Yeah, because the, the, the uh, x-ray technician told me that my neck is too straight. And well, I, I, I mean, an x-ray is just a static picture, just a, just a one-time picture, and necks can move. But one of the signs you look at is if you have a normal curvature to the neck called a lordosis. And if, it's, if, if you lose that lordosis in, in the cervical spine, that suggests muscle spasm, but it's not more specific than that. So Claudette, why don't you, you, we have another, you know, you can call Dr. Manning or any of the other doctor, any other orthopedic doctors, but it sounds like it's a good idea to get a second opinion. 
Okay. So I'm, I'm going to call Dr. Manning. Okay, and you're going to give us a call next week and let us know how it went? Yes. Thanks a lot. We're now going to go. I, I think we might have an, a winner to the quiz, actually. John? John? Yes. Hi. Hi, Dr. Jonah. How I are you? I heard a rumor that you may know the answer to the quiz. Yes. Uh, dreamt. You know, this dreamt is correct, and I, I don't know how you got it so quickly. I was thinking about it for a week. Really? Yeah, I'm, well, I'm a little slow. But how did, how did that happen? How did you, you just well, came? I do, uh, I do a lot of reading now, Doc, because um, I was uh, diagnosed uh, about a year and a half, two years ago almost, with a rare cancer, Pseudomaxoma peritonea. I don't know if you ever heard of it. Yes, yes. And cancer of the appendix. And I'm having a hard, you know, hard time now I was getting treatments and things like that. And I've been to Sloan Kettering and everything, and right now I'm on watch. I take CAT scans and different tests to keep watch on it. Do you have a fluid? And I do a lot of reading. Yeah, and no, this is great. Do you have a fluid? Is it painful? This, the, uh, uh, no, it's not really. Good. It, I tell you the truth, it wasn't painful. I went, in, I went in about two years ago for something else. I had pain on my other side, on my, on my, on my left side, and it was a hernia. And the doctor who was very good, Dr. Kumar in Brooklyn here, mm -hmm. he uh, didn't like the way my stomach looked for some reason. So I said, well, why? It's a hernia. It was obvious. It was down. And uh, he said, uh, no, I want you to go for a CAT scan. I want to see. And then when I took the CAT scan a few days later, he called me. He said, I'm going to sit down now. You got, you got a tumor on your right side. And that was my appendix. It had come out of the appendix. Most people, either he said to me, it explodes the appendix. Or, in your case, what happened was, which is very rare, it comes out and, and it engulfs the appendix. Yeah. And then it was starting to spread. But he had got it in time before it spread to the other organs, like the colon. I had to go for colonoscopy immediately. Because at that time I was fit, over 50. I hadn't had one. So he said, you immediately got to go. I got to see when I go in, is, is there anything wrong with the colon? So he, when they took colonoscopy, I was, I was okay. I had a lot of polyps. But nothing hadn't spread to the large intestine. It's the importance of catching something early. Yeah, he the, caught it. He caught it. It was amazing how he caught that because I had no pain on that side. Amazing. And, and it was the appendix. But he said the whole cancer came out and uh, engulfed the appendix. And then usually they just go. But see, it was so slow moving. That's, if you want to call it a benefit of that cancer, the slow moving cancer. So, John. And, yeah. you're, and you're going, sounds like you're going to the best place. You're, going to, you're getting great treatment. Yeah. And we, yeah. Wish you, we wish you well. And now you have to remember to give your name and phone number and address off air so we can get that plaque to you. Oh, really? Do you That's have right. a site? Do you have a place picked out in the house? Oh, sure. I got my mantle right here. Oh, right <laughs> above. <laughs> and my wife, she's got a million places here. Matter of fact, we would just, we would just have celebrated our 30th wedding anniversary. Oh, congratulations. We went to Douglaston with uh, uh, Bishop Damasio. Oh, wow. And that's why we're praying for him today, because he celebrated the Mass April 18th for us. Fantastic. And we got our plaque from him, and now it's going to go right next to his, his picture and plaque. Well, yeah. Well, I, ho I hope you enjoy the plaque. Look at it. Feel good every time you look at it. I appreciate it, Doctor. Thanks a lot. Take care. Let's go to Loretta now. Hi, Loretta. Hi, Dr. Garner. Hi. You know Loretta Young at all? That's a, <laughs> <laughs> that's a nice name, isn't it? <laughs> yes, I do. Where are you from? That's in Hearst, Brooklyn. Oh, great neighborhood, great neighborhood. What's your favorite place out there to eat? Tommaso's. To me too. I love that place. You ever hear the opera singing in there? Yes. I know, I can't stand it. No, it's, <laughs> it's good. It's good, it's good. It's good. But, uh, what, the food's not bad. So, no, the food is excellent. Yeah. What can we do for you tonight? I have a question for the cardiologist. She's right next to me, yes. Dr. Nikitna, what's the yes. question? Okay, we're ready. Uh, okay. The question is, I'm seeing the cardiologist on uh, Thursday, and I do have heart problems, and he wanted to do a NGA uh, gram, but I'm allergic to the um, dye, and I heard that there's a CAT scan, the cardinary CAT scan. Is uh, that any good? Uh, quick question. Uh, you said you're allergic to a dye. How do you know you're allergic to the dye? I'm allergic to shellfish. Okay, only shellfish. Uh, but you never had a CAT scan with a contrast. Right. Okay. First of all, they're using contrast right now, which does not contain any, anything, uh, any iodine. And if you uh, tell in advance, we can prepare you and we, you will virtually won't have any side effects of a procedure. Uh, there is a test called CAT scan, which you refer to. And uh, I truly believe in that test, and it helps a lot to uh, 
have additional step in diagnosis of coronary artery disease. It basically shows the vessels of the heart uh, in the same way as a uh, coronary, coronary catheterization showed, but without procedure itself. Um, there are some limitations in terms of CAT scan, uh, how, how, can, how well you can visualize the vessels. Uh, very rarely you have limitations comparing to the catheterization. Still, catheterization is a gold standard, it's 100% test. But uh, with a CAT scan, they're using the same contrast as they're using with a catheterization. And again, we can use a medic special contrast which does not contain iodine. All so right, you that's the you Gavison, should not. right? Isn't that the Gavison dye? Say again? Is that Gavison dye, right? Uh, it's a special um, uh, iodine, it's a special contrast which does not contain anything which will cause an allergic reaction. But again, we can prepare, we can give you a small dose of prednisone and that which prevent you to have any reaction. Right. I hope you listen to that because what Dr. Nikitin is saying is absolutely correct. People who think they're allergic to dye are actually not. Actually being allergic to shellfish doesn't mean you're allergic to the dye. And the, with the type of dye that we use now, it shouldn't pose a problem. So. Just go, go to the right place and they'll do the right thing. Okay. Okay? All right, thank you. Nice to talk well. to you. I see we have Rose Marie. Hi, hi Rose Marie. Hello? Hi, how are you? Oh, hi, Doctor. How are you? Very good. <laughs> you were, I, you're a previous winner, no? No, it wasn't me. But no. do you I did know the answer this time, That's, which is amazing, but I'm glad John won. Yeah, yeah. I don't yeah. know how I'm going to get my plaque, but John deserves it. <laughs> Next week, there'll be another question. <laughs> right. Right. Well, anyway. I wanted to thank you for your uh, beautiful uh, article in the tablet about chronic fatigue. I suffer from that. That's number one. I wanted to say that to you. And thank you. I, that was wonderful that you brought it out because people think, you know, it's all in your head. And I mean, my question is, <laughs> my mother, when she sits in her easy chair <laughs> watching the doctors, uh -huh. her feet um, get like numbness and uh, some tingling. But when she gets up, it uh, goes away. So I was wondering what, you know, you thought that was. Yeah, I see Dr. Manning looking to take this one. Okay. Uh, does your mom have any issues with her back, any arthritis, uh, problems with the back or anything of that yes, nature? Yes, she does. Yeah. It sounds like she may have a, a pinched nerve or radiculopathy, as we call it, mm -hmm. and, and that can be positional. Oh. Uh, sometimes as you age, you get arthritic bone spurs, thickened ligaments, and, and, and disc, uh, the discs can move. Yeah, because she and, has like a degenerate degenerative disc I think or exactly disc? right so yeah. it, maybe when she's sitting which actually puts more strain on the back than standing ah. she may be uh, some of those tissues may be rubbing her nerves that okay. supply the feet wonderful um, so I mean um, I understand that well, that's what I think it is oh thank you so you're much mm -hmm. thanks and you're doing a wonderful job thank you you guys thanks have a great week <laughs> okay bye. before we go to the next caller I have part of our email and I, I see one for dr. Rusi I believe it's from, it's from uh, I won't mention the name, from Dr. McCormick's office. Some of the works, uh, Dr. McCormick is one of our noted dermatologists in Staten Island. She's been on the show many times. She says, hope the wife and family is well. Gives a nice little salutations and greetings. And then says, two to three weeks ago, I had bronchitis. The chest x-ray was clear. And then I got laryngitis. I went to ear, nose, and throat doctor who said I have a large polyp and need surgery to remove it. She doesn't want surgery. Is there anything short of surgery? And it's really an ENT question, but maybe you can talk a little bit about bronchitis for us. And, uh, polyps. Sure, yeah. Bronchitis as opposed to pneumonia is basically a d disorder of the airways. It's an infection of the airways uh, uh, where an x-ray will be normal. So when someone has a cough productive of sputum, um, often their primary care doctor or pulmonologist will get an x-ray if it's been persisting, especially despite antibiotics. And if we see that the x-ray is normal, then usually we call it bronchitis. If the x-ray shows what we call an infiltrate or a spot there, then it's more of a pneumonia. Um, as the caller said, other things can cause cough and, and those symptoms besides bronchitis and pneumonia, including upper airway problems. Uh, without knowing really the specifics, the size of the nodule, I think it would be in her best interest, and I think it sounds like your doctor has you on the right track, and, and following with an ear, nose, and throat doctor where they can quantify the size of it and uh, see if it's worth removing. Um, but short of surgery, if it's really uh, causing a problem, continues a problem, I think uh, the ear, ear, nose, and throat doctor will come up with the best solution. And again, right, get those questions in on the internet and we'll pose it to the experts as they come in. And now I see we have Shirley waiting. Hi, Shirley. Hi. Hi, Shirley. What's going on? Where are you tonight? In Crown Heights in my house. It's quiet out there? Yes. That's good. You're resting. Yes. That's nice. 
What do you like to eat? What do you like to eat in Crown Heights? We always have this problem where we don't have a great restaurant out there. I go to Chinese restaurant because I can't find nothing to eat. Yeah. I don't make enough money to go out and eat. Well, you got to speak to your boss about that and yes, see what I you do. can do. <laughs> what can we do for you? Well, in the last couple of weeks, when I go to bed at night, I have to bend my legs. If I make a mistake and let my legs lay straight, in the morning when I get up, I can't bend them. It takes me from 20 minutes to a half an hour to, um, to bend them to get out of bed. Mm -hmm. And I would like to know what caused that. It's a lot of pain trying to bend my legs to get up. It's, it sounds like what you're describing is morning stiffness, which is one of the hallmarks of uh, developing arthritis. May I ask you your age? 59. So you're in the right age category. Have you had any problems with your knees prior? Yes. They sent me to therapy. Mm -hmm. Was that helpful? No. Okay. Do you take any medicine for the inflammation? I take Celebrex. Mm -hmm. I take Motrin. I take Aleve. Any of them been helpful? The Aleve work for a while, and then I switch to Celebrex. And when that run out, I go back to Motrin. I rotate them. Okay. And do you do any exercise regularly? Yeah, I walk enough. Yeah, I do a lot of walking. Well, there may be other exercises aside from walking, like an exercise bike or something that won't strain you. Um, but stiffness is one of the hallmarks of arthritis, particularly morning stiffness. Unfortunately, there's no cure for it, but you can keep the symptoms down by keeping your joints flexible and taking anti-inflammatories as necessary. Shirley, I hope that helps. And uh, make an appointment to see your boss, all right? Yes, I will. Take care. Be well. Joan. Hello. Hi. How are you, Joan? Hello. Hi, Joan. Hi. How are you doing? Well, I'm in a lot of pain. Oh, what's going on? Uh, I, you know what you got to do, Joan? Just turn the TV I, off for I a second. Did. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry about that. I, uh, I have arthritis, and I've had it for years in the right hip. I uh -huh. can't hear what you're saying. I put the mute. No, no, I'm listening. It's okay. Okay. And uh, I, I manage it pretty well. I take two Ecotrins in the morning. I don't go to a doctor for it. Uh, I uh, rest when I have a pain, and I try to walk when I'm not in pain, and I've been managing it pretty well. But, however, I find that if I sit for a long period of time, if I'm at like a luncheon or something like that, the following day I'm very stiff. So Sunday was a day that I did a lot of sitting. And yesterday, the day after, I did a lot of shopping and walking, and I developed a slight limp in the left leg due to a pain in the left hip, which I never had before. And um, it wasn't too bad until about 4 or 5 o'clock today. It got much, much worse where I had difficulty even walking. And uh, the pain is very bad in it. And John, John, I'm going to ask Dr. Uh, Manning to, to take a stab at that one. Thank you. Uh, when's the last time you had any x-rays of your hips? I never did. Uh, that's probably where you should start. So you can get an idea how bad or how advanced the arthritis is. Even if it is advanced, you can probably uh, do better than taking Ecotrin. The other prescription medicines that may be stronger, may be more effective for you. Hopefully you won't have any of the side effects, stomach problems, bleeding, uh, but or what have you. But I never had a pain in the left hip before. You may, may, may be developing arthritis in that side. You may be overcompensating, taking pressure off the right side. It's so the bad left side. that I can hardly walk right now. I, I think I would start with an x-ray to see exactly what you have. Also, in the last year or two, uh, uh, it happens maybe only once a year, and that's about all I could talk, take it. Uh, if I'm driving my car and I'm in, in traffic uh, where I'm doing a lot of brake and, and uh, you know, back and forth with the brake and the accelerator for quite a uh, uh, long time, when I go to get out of the car, my uh, right leg, the inside muscle from the groin down to the knee goes into a spasm that the pain is excruciating. Would that be connected in any way with the arthritis? Uh, possibly, or it could be coming from your back if you have irritated nerve roots in your back. Um, but it sounds like you need workup uh, of your hip and, and your lower back, see if we can differentiate. John, make sure you get and get that x-ray, okay? Okay. Do you think that, well. that a shot would help the pain in that leg? I have no idea what the pain's coming from, so I wouldn't recommend a shot till I knew. Okay, thank you. You're Take welcome. Care. Uh, before we go on to the next, I heard Dr. talking about aspirin. And I know that many people are recommended to take aspirin for heart protective. Who should be taking aspirin and who shouldn't? And how does it work? 
uh, according the, to the guidelines, so we do recommend to take uh, aspirin for people who has a higher risk for uh, developing of stroke and heart attack, the people who are smokers, people who do have a high blood pressure, diabetics, uh, high cholesterol. Um, I would probably recommend some people who have borderline high blood pressure or borderline numbers of sugar and cholesterol. So just tell them, because they, they, they don't know the numbers. Like what, when you say about borderline blood pressure, what number are we talking about? Uh, officially, it's 140 over 80. If everything, if most of the time you have uh, numbers above this, uh, it's called hypertension, needs to be taken care of. Mm -hmm. Again, it doesn't mean that you have to take care of this today, but uh, you should see the doctor and uh, address this issue. And what about cholesterol? What would you like to see the per people out there at the level be? Unfortunately, the, with the cholesterol, it's a little bit a complicated story. There are bad cholesterol, and good cholesterols, and depends on what group uh, of people, if the high risk uh, people who had already diabetes and the heart disease, the cholesterol, the bad cholesterol should be below 100. Uh, if it's uh, youngish people with no any uh, risk factors, it should be below 160. And as far as sugar, what do you like to see? Because I know we get this, we keep getting calls about these levels. Is, is it 100, 109, 120? What, what number do you like to see on fasting sugar? The fasting sugar should be below 120. Mm -hmm. The thing is, even if fasting sugar is lower, uh, sometime after food, sugar doesn't come to normal level right away, how normal people do. So there are specific tests which call hemoglobin A1C, which I usually recommend to do people because it show an early sign of diabetes. So excellent, and we talked about that last week in the news, hemoglobin A1C. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nikita. Let's go to Josephine. Hi, Josephine. Hi, doctor. How are you doing today? All right, and you? Okay, we're doing fine. What did you do today? Excuse me? Yeah, what was the highlight of your day? Oh, uh, all right. W no, the what highlight was of my day is taking care of my mother. Oh. <laughs> is that the question? You have a question about your mother? Yes. What can we do for you? Okay, uh, she's been suffering from a severe itchiness on her body. From November. Okay, so it's severe itchiness, and then there were a lot of potential causes. Uh, she had a biopsy done also, it showed inconclusive. Uh huh. Is this a skin patch that's itching, or the whole skin? The whole skin. It's uh -huh. like a rash is coming out after she scratches it. And where did she biopsy it? Excuse me? Where was it biopsy? What part of the body? Uh, the shoulder part. Yeah. And this is syndrome, uh, maybe Dr. Ru Rusi wants to talk about, where people scratch and actually the rash comes after they scratch. Uh, that's it. That's it. And I would like to know if, uh, could it be maybe the shingles inside of her? And I would like to know if uh, she could be hospitalized because her primary care doctor doesn't want her hospitalized. Yeah. Again, rash can have psychological basis. Uh, Dr. Rusi? In, yes. terms, in, in terms of shingles, usually it's a very painful rash. Usually it's isolated to one area of the body called a dermatome because it follows the nerve distribution. Yes. Uh, usually it has a characteristic uh, uh, vesicle, what we call an uh, oozing. From what you're describing, I don't think it's shingles. No. Um, itching in general in the elderly, I think one of the most common causes, believe it or not, is dry skin. And I think uh, moisturizer or something like that. Uh, and twice a week, uh, and, 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 uh, all kinds of creams, even antibiotics you put her on. An another possibility, I'd be interested to know if she uh, has started on any new medications, no. whether they be over-the-counter or prescribed medications. No, no. no, no. Um, interesting. Other things, maybe something different in the house. Uh, I know some patients, I, I had one several years ago, uh, we narrowed it down to the thing you put in the dryer, bounce, uh -huh. and uh, no, they started using that, and we realized that that was the culprit. We stopped Sounds it. Sounds like you have to be a detective, right? And figure yeah, out what's new pads much. and so on. And then I think there are medications, Adirac, some medications they give the to. That's the one she's on. Right. Sometimes helps to stop. Sometimes it can be harmful because it makes you tired and you can fall. Dr. Nikita, do you have any... Um, any suggestions? I just want to make sure, I mean, I'm pretty sure your doctor actually checked the blood test uh, thyroid function because any abnormality inside of the body, as I said, uh, thyroid liver disease can uh, cause a problem. So I just want to make sure that that was checked too. The blood test? No, no blood test for the itch, no. It's a good idea. Get, a, get that second opinion. It's been going on a year. Get a second opinion. As Dr. Nikitin pointed out, a blood test would be useful. And, um, All right, ask them for a blood test first. We, or, or discuss that with your doctor. All right. But okay. would the hospital be any help? Yeah, definitely. You, but the, the key is to get a doctor, and All then right. the doctor can arrange the right All stuff. All right, I'll talk to the doctor. Uh, thank you, doctor. Take care. Be well, Josephine. Have a nice night. Thank you. You too. We're looking now to hear from Jane on line three. Jane? Jane? Hi, Jane. Hello. How are you? 
Um, I guess I'm okay for the moment. Where are you calling from? I'm calling from Manus Harbor, Staten Island. Oh, is it, what's, how's Staten Island tonight? Nice and clear out there? Yeah, but I don't go outside much, so I couldn't really tell you. Why don't you go outside? I'm a real, real bad heart patient. Oh, tell us about it. Okay, I have a defibrillator. I Turn your I TV down. I have a defibrillator. Yeah. Uh-huh. You have a defibrillator? I have cardiomyopathy. Okay. Metro low, low press. Uh -huh. I sometimes get pericarditis. How old are you? I have asthma. Mm -hmm. I have, I'm a class 3 for congestive heart failure. How old are you? I'm 42. My mother died at 40, and my father died at 65 with their heart. So you have a lot of things going on. I'm mean, asking Dr. Nikitna, did you hear the cardiomyopathy, the fibrillators, heart failure? Yeah, can you tell me a little bit more? Do, you, do we know why you have a, a weak muscle? I had a slight heart attack eight years ago. Um, since I had my defibrillator, it's been, two, it's been two years since I had it. It went off twice already. Um, I'm going to meet the committee to put me on the list for the heart <laughs> transplant, and I, I wanted to know. So I just not go with a heart, or how long, how, I mean, how significant it could be if I didn't get a heart and just, just keep what God gave me. Again, my, my injector factor is 15. I understood. Again, you are a very, very young person, and you just mentioned that you have not only a lung, a heart disease, but also... And I just had, I'm sorry, yeah. I just had a minor stroke in December. And uh, as I said, you have a heart disease and a lung disease. And um, you mentioned that you have a class 3 uh, congestive heart failure means that you can do minimal activity and then you develop shortness of breath and you really cannot live uh, no, with these symptoms. Uh, the best shot for that is to uh, go be evaluated for a heart and lung transplant. And uh, as the technology improving every year, they do amazing work for that. And uh, so many people actually did uh, get transplant and leave uh, 10, 20 years after, and uh, 30 years after, as long as we know. So as, uh, do you know what center are you going, actually? Say that again, I didn't what, hear you. What center are you going for, uh, for a transplantation evaluation? What, what hospital are you in? Yes. Um, Columbia Presbyterian. Excellent, excellent. So you should go, you should have your chance. Because now I have to ask you a question, because the only reason I'm scared to do it is because I have a lot of medical problems. I'm high blood pressure, diabetes, I just had a minor stroke. I lost 50 percent of my must, my motor skills. I have no feeling in my right hand. I get physical therapy and OT at home. Again, they will be able to evaluate you and decide uh, what will be the best for you because uh, obviously they will make the best shot. They make sure that you're on the right medication first before they pursue with any surgery. Okay. Okay. You have to be on the right medication first. You know, a lot of the problems are related to your problems, so it's hard to say, you know, the problems that you're describing are related to the problems that you're having with your heart and lungs. And as true. Dr. Nikitin has said, true. I agree with you 100%. you're a young person. You're a young person and you have a long life ahead of you. And get in there so. and get that transplant. I just want to ask her yeah. one more question. If she was me and I'm going towards the committee July 10th, is there any important questions that I should really ask? They are actually uh, will tell you what tests you need to do before. They will tell you what medication to take before. If you are not on all right medication right now, they will first adjust uh, medicine, make sure everything is top notch and, and then they will offer any surgery and will uh, tell you what is the best for you, what kind and of surgery you need to do and, and so forth. Say Great. I do good in my surgery, how long is the re um, recuperation time about? Again, it depends on how complicated it's going to be procedure, how long you're going to wait for a procedure because it's, uh, sometimes it's not that fast. <coughs> Marie? Okay. Like yes. you said, heart people should take aspirins, but I'm allergic to aspirin. I'm on Plavix and I'm on Coumadin. Marie, you see, you're, you have a very special type of, of heart disease, yeah. and there were different recommendations for the general public and those who have specific illnesses. And I think you're on the right track, as Dr. Keaton has told you. You have a long life ahead. You're going to go before the committee. And are you going to call us back and let us know how things are going? This is my first time ever seeing your show. What time do you come on and what days do you come We're on? We're on ev every Tuesday night from 8 at night to 9. I will let you know as soon as I get my results back, I guess. And the best of luck. 
Good luck. Thank We're you praying so for much, you. and y'all have a blessed night. Thank, Thank you, you, too. Good luck, Marie. Hi, Michelle. Michelle? Hi, how you doing, Doctor? Hi, where are you calling from? Canarsie, Brooklyn. Canarsie, yeah, my children went to school there, 272, 276, are you near those? Oh, okay. Uh -huh. Do you have uh, any children attending the school? Yes. Uh, are they still good? Yes. I know, they were excellent schools. My daughter yeah. just graduated, actually, ophthalmology resident yesterday, and, uh, and they went through this, the Canarsie public school system, thank you. So what can we do? For, and my other daughter's in radiology at Downstate, so I just uh, <laughs> want to point out through the Canarsie school system. They did very well. So what can we do for you? Uh, I'm getting a lot of pain on my left side. In the left side? Yes. Okay. Where the heart is. Where the heart is, okay. Yes. And I wanted to know if it's muscle pain. Right, it's always a good question. How do you know you have chest pain? Is it a heart attack or is it a muscle? And I'm sure may we have three opinions on that. Dr. Nikita. May I ask you how old you are? I'm 27. You're 27. Uh, do you smoke? No. Okay. Do you have any risk factors, high, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes? No. Okay. And how long have you been having this pain? Uh, for a year now. I'm sorry, say again? About a year. One year. Um, and typically, the pain in young women uh, with no risk factors is not coming from a heart. Again, I want to make sure that uh, you see the doctor and make sure you have an electrocardiogram and a regular test, uh, blood test and blood pressure check just to make sure that uh, all these risk factors are not in your category. And Dr. Rusi, how, did, how does she know if it's heart disease or related to her lungs? Yeah, I, I, in full agreement with Dr. Nikita in, in the sense that the duration of the pain is very important. If you told me all of a sudden this came on yesterday or last night, I think the red flag would be up that we'd have to really evaluate you for some serious conditions, blood clots, heart attacks. But the fact that it's been going on for a year is somewhat reassuring, but I think it certainly still merits uh, investigation. I think a physical examination is, is key. Often reproducibility of the pain suggests um, that it's musculoskeletal in, in, in origin. Um, other things can cause chest pain, even GERD, acid reflux, sometimes can mimic chest pain. I, I think if you've been having it for a year, I would at least have an x-ray as a baseline. In all likelihood, it'll be negative, but you never know. Something might show up on the x-ray that could lead us one way or another. Thank you. And Dr. Manning, any? Yeah, I would just ask if the, the pain is associated with any particular emotions or activities that, that you uh, perform. Uh, no. Um, and is it um, in the center of the chest, more to the side of the chest, ribs? Uh, side of the chest. Does it bother you when you take a deep breath at all? Yeah. Maybe pulmonary then, or it could be chest wall. So I sound like you need a workup. See, we need, you need a workup. I think the general feeling is not, it's probably not going to turn out to be related to the heart, but we're not too, you can't be too smart, so you want to get it checked out. Let's go to Kelly now. Thanks for calling. Hi, Kelly. Yes. Hi, how are you? Where are you calling us from? Good. I'm calling from Windsor Terrace. Very nice. Not too far from here. What can we do? Because we're running short on time. What can we do for you? Um, I had a question. Um, my son had reconstruction on his knee at 17 years old. Now uh -huh. he's 19. And probably twice a year since it's happened, his knee swells for absolutely no reason, becomes extremely painful and extremely swollen. Um, we've gone to a few different doctors. And... They say, like, rehab, we've gone through rehab, um, we've done a few different things. I just want to know, is there any reason why it would swell? It seems like the knee is still tight. The M MCL and the ACL and everything is, every okay. doctor tells me, it's still tight. All right, Kelly, I'm going to ask Dr. Manning. The, the short answer is knees don't swell for no reason at all. Um, you said he had an ACL and an MCL reconstruction done? Yes, you actually did the surgery. Okay. And he, um, he recovered well in terms of his strength and flexibility? Yes. Okay. Um, and, and when do they swell? Is he doing any activities at that time? or? Um, no, the last time it happened, actually, I was walking down the street with him, and he turned to me, and his knee buckled, and we were just walking. Well, if it buckles, it, it, it sounds like either the muscles aren't strong on the outside, or he still has some type of internal um, instability, uh, internal derangement. Uh, has he had a follow-up MRI after his studies? No. Um, last week, they told us to go for three more months of physical therapy, and then they would do another MRI. I'm not saying that's wrong, but if it's been going on for a while, you might want to get the MRI a little sooner. Kelly, I hope that helps, all right? Okay, Make sure yes, it does. Thank you. Get sure. in there. Hi. Sh hi, Cheryl. Okay, yes, it does. Sh Cheryl, yeah. hi. How can, what can we do for you? We only, time is very short. I think Cheryl's listening to a TV. Cheryl? Hello, yes, yes. Hi. What's, what's the question? How are you today? Um, I'm a 
seven year old and I live in Brownsville, Brooklyn. Uh huh. And when I bend over, it feels like everything is coming up like you know, like my I don't know, like something is coming from the bottom up to overpower like my heart. Uh huh. So and I was wondering like what is like I get it like a bad cramping. Okay, so Dr. Nikita, when she bends over, she feels like something is taking over her heart. Uh, if you experience some pressure when you're bending over, there are a couple of things which can be related. And most likely, it's a gastroenterologic problem. Some people do have a pouch uh, in the esophagus, it's a feeding tube, which is called uh, hernia. And I had a hernia, yes, it was my navel. Navel, no, I was talking about the hernia in the um, uh, feeding tube. A hiatal hernia, and this is if it's too big, it can actually you can experience the symptoms like that. Thanks for your call. And the last caller of the night is Carmen. Hi, call, Carmen. Hello, hi. You, last caller of the night, how are you? I'm good, I'm good. What can we do for you? I have a question. I have a what they call a left branch, something in my heart, a left bundle branch block, right? Yes, and I want to know exactly what it is. Well, we, it could take a long time, but in, in 30 seconds, Dr. Nikita. One of the functions of the heart is electricity, and if there is a, a blockage in a, one of the conductive systems of the heart, it represents an electrocardiogram as a, as a block. If your function of the heart is normal and if there is no plumbing uh, s problem in the vessel of the heart, then it's, uh, you just live with this. But you have to make sure there is no problem with the plumbing and, uh, and the okay. pumping of the heart. I'm Thank taking a baby aspirin every day. Is that okay? Uh, y yes. Carmen, thank you for the call. Thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, again, it's, it's amazing because the calls continue, and I wish we could stay longer to, um, <laughs> to, help, to help these questions. I think Keaton has had it, I think, right? You've had, it's a long day, long day. But anyway, I want to thank it. That's, that, that's it for this edition. Let's thank Dr. Anastasia Nikitna, Dr. Thomas Rusi, and Dr. Reggie Manning for coming in. And we hope we've been able to help you. It's good to remember that you should be proactive about your health. Speak to your doctors about your concerns, and as we said tonight, go for second or even third opinions. In the meantime, continue to watch this show every Tuesday night or visit our website at netny.net slash askthedoctor. There you can do many things like watch special video blogs, see past episodes, or send in questions. I want to thank you for all your calls tonight. I'll see you again next week at 8 p.m. Goodbye, stay healthy, and we'll see you in the tablet. <laughs>